We're going to get started now. Hello, everybody, and good afternoon. Thank you to everyone here on campus today and online for joining us for this major milestone recognizing AI's integral role within the ecosystem of this state that we love so much. My name is Miklos Machuszewski, and I am the Associate Director of Business Development for the Institute for Experiential AI here at the Rue Institute. Come find me today to discuss how the EAI engages with our business partners. And throughout the day, if you have any questions or comments, look for the red lanyard. The folks wearing red lanyards can help with questions ranging from, will AI ever be sentient, to where is the restroom? <laughs> Just as we believe that our development and use of artificial intelligence must be human-centric in order to create positive change, we know it is people, their ideas, and the way they're able to work together that will power Maine's growth and development from now into the future. And it is the people featured in this report and the people gathered here today that make this moment so thrilling. So now I'd like to introduce two people who are leading us into this moment to officially welcome you. Dr. Usama Fayad, Executive Director at the Institute for Experiential AI, has been a leading light in the field of artificial intelligence and data for more than three decades. A pioneer in the field of data mining and someone with far too many accolades for me to list here, he has dedicated his career to human-centric artificial intelligence. And Margaret Angel, head of partnerships at the Rue Institute, has dedicated hers to forging the personal human connections on which the future of Maine's technological economy will be built. It is my honor to introduce them to kick off the launch event for the 2023 State of AI in Maine. Welcome to the State of AI in Maine event, here in beautiful Portland. It is an honor to have each and every one of you in attendance today. We are gathered here to discuss the ways in which organizations across our great state are leveraging the power, power of artificial intelligence to advance their missions and drive innovation. AI has the potential to transform industries and change the way we live and work, from healthcare to finance, transportation to education. AI is already making a significant impact. But it's not just large companies and tech giants that are taking advantage of this technology. Organizations of all sizes and across all sectors are finding ways to harness the power of AI to better serve their customers, improve their operations, and drive growth. We are proud to be part of a welcoming and innovative business community here in Maine. The organizations represented here today are a testament to the cutting edge work being done in our state and the dedication of our business and academic leaders to drive progress. I am excited to hear from our speakers and panelists about their experiences and insights on how AI is being used to drive success in their organizations. Thank you for being here, and let's dive in to explore the state of AI in Maine. thoughts about the power of AI and the welcoming and innovative business community in Maine. And that's what it produced. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, my husband and I came across that quote early in the pandemic. Um, 
Uh, it's attributable to the science fiction writer William Gibson. And as we saw the case numbers rising in Italy, if you can all remember when Italy was at the bleeding edge of the pandemic, um, we kept thinking about that, right? The future is already here, it's just not evenly distributed. And I feel like there are times in your life when you feel that very viscerally. Um, and with the rise of AI and these technologies, we all feel that very viscerally. Um, and, and the question becomes, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna use these tools to have broad, positive, and equitable impact um, across our state and our community? Um, and these are the questions and the opportunities that gave rise to uh, Northeastern and what motivates us here. And so uh, for those of you who don't know us, um, uh, we are Northeastern University. We have 35,000 students, 2,500 faculty members, 14 global campuses. We launched here in Portland three years ago. We're actually celebrating our third birthday today. Uh, we launched three years ago here in Portland is the Rue Institute. And our uh, mission here is to create economic development through a focus on technology and life sciences. Um, and we do that through graduate education, research, and entrepreneurship. Um, and that is what motivates here, us here, to create this platform for all of us to come together to grow and, and address these questions and issues. And so that's what we want to do today. And we welcome you um, here to do that. And so before I hand it over to Sama, who can actually talk about <laughs> the substance with all of his background, um, I would love to introduce the people that brought this together. And the first group I'd like is all of our um, external steering committee. If you could all stand up. You know who you are. <laughs> stay standing, stay standing. Um, and then everybody, everybody who was interviewed for the report, please stand up. All of our speakers and panelists, will you please stand up? And then, and then finally, if, uh, the team at Northeastern uh, who put this event on, both from the Rue Institute and the Institute for Experiential AI, if you could stand up. a collaborative and community event and we're just really really pleased to have everybody here um, for the day to do it and with that I'm going to hand it over to Usama who as you heard has many many years of seeing the future before people most people have um, with all of his work in AI and data science and it is really his team at the experiential AI Institute that conceived of this project um, and then drove it to where it is today Thank you, Margaret. Uh, and I hope uh, I hope all of you realize that ChatGPT probably <coughs> scanned a lot of the material we've been using <laughs> to promote this event. Because I recognize some of the sentences. <laughs> so look, welcome everyone, and, and thanks for joining us. Uh, you are here because, like, like us, hopefully, uh, you believe AI is going to play an important role in the future of the state and uh, in the future of the technology for tomorrow in general, which means big deal for the economy of the future. And we hope that, like us, you are curious as to what this means for our state. So I'll say a few words regarding our approach to putting the report together uh, on the state of AI in Maine. More importantly, why we think it's important. So when we say artificial intelligence, most people think about you know, the demoware, the, the, the snazzy, visible stuff, the chat GBTs, the DALIs, and the Lenza AI, and so forth. Um, well, this is all fascinating, exciting, and may grab our attention for a while before we forget all about it. Um, our approach has been much more pragmatic and concrete. We wanted to actually 
figure out. You know, we know AI is, is hitting us everywhere, be it in the business, public, or private lives. The, if you take an academic angle on it, uh, you, you get one view. If you take an economic angle on it, you basically would ask a question, or the question that came to my mind is, OK, so the state of Maine, where is it on this journey of adopting this technology? Uh, and we're definitely on that journey. And for us to understand how this journey is going to progress, we need to understand where we are today. So the way I view this report that is released today is it's a baseline. It just kind of attempts to say, where are we? And it attempts to identify certain opportunities where I think um, we have interesting opportunities. Uh, this morning I was watching Dave Rue uh, do his speech of three years ago when we launched the Institute. And one statement, the Rural Institute, uh, and one statement he made that really stuck in my mind and is still relevant today, is he said, Maine is underperforming when measured against its potential. And I really believe that. I think there's a lot of interesting good AI happening. I think we could be doing a lot more to leverage those things. So you're going to hear from many companies, educational institutions, organizations, and so forth, in Maine on how AI is already part of what they are doing day to day. We wanted to start there, get the space right, and then help identify areas where we think we could go that give us uh, leadership, potentially nationally, regionally, maybe even internationally. And this is not kind of dreams. I actually believe that there are certain strengths to the state of Maine that are unique to it that could be played out uh, into very, very big areas. Um, if you think about it, you know, marine technology, what is the fancy term for it is blue tech, right? We are a state that cares about that, about fisheries, forestry, other aspects uh, like, you know, peaceful coexistence with the environment, preserving the environment. Uh, all of these are big issues. There are areas where we could stand a real chance to kind of lead the world uh, one problem that comes to mind, and there's many, you know, how do you deal with an aging population, both from a lifestyle and a healthcare perspective? The rest of the world may not be there, but get, guess what? Many states are going to follow us here, and many countries are going to follow us here. If we figure out the right formula for how to do it right, how do we leverage technology to do it in innovative ways, and that's an just one example of many where we could create a whole new economy that's relevant to uh, nationally and to the world. So uh, once we understand the baseline of where we are, we can start tracking our progress, identifying where we are missing out on important opportunities, kind of stop underperforming when it's within the reach of our potential, and maybe extend uh, to do more. The next question is, how do we make the right progress real and achievable? And this is a lot less complicated than you might think it is. Many people think it's kind of uh, black magic to make AI work. It's not. It's a simple process. I believe it requires two things. And most, com most, most companies, 99.999% of companies in the world don't understand it. Number one is what we call experiential AI, which is our code word for human in the loop AI. It means computer-assisted human intelligence working with human-assisted computer intelligence. Right? And this, this is one secret formula for kind of starting that virtual cycle that can get us to places where we start looking magical. The second one that's missed by the rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, is data. Right? Chat GPT, billions of dollars were spent in the background gathering data, labeling data, adjusting data, all of that, and then making it available for algorithms to use in the analysis. Uh, this happens at Google, this happens at Amazon, this happens at all these places, much more than you think. With humans interacting and humans helping and human, humans adjusting. If Google stopped kind of retraining its algorithm on human feedback, within a few days to a week, 
the engine will become so poor in its ability to find results and so forth. And they understand this. They have huge, they have armies of people uh, working on this problem. So with that, um, I just wanted to mention that the report we are releasing today is the culmination of four months of research by our team, which included 50 interviews. Uh, I think there's a map here with the interviews, yep. Uh, 50 interviews with, um, within numerous sectors. We wanted to keep it general, we wanted to get a good idea. We hope you find the report useful, and we hope today's proceedings give you with a good understanding of where AI is used by organizations in Maine, and we have opportunities to leverage it to build the future economy of Maine um, are, are to be found. So at this point, I'd like to hand off the mic to uh, Professor Mike Polastri, who is the Senior Vice President at Northeastern, uh, Senior Vice Provost at Northeastern. But more importantly, he's the guy who heads research and academics at the Rue Institute. And he was one of the, should I call them the three musketeers? One of the founding leadership team members of the Rue Institute when we first uh, got the privilege to fund it. So with that, Mike will ask <laughs> uh, welcome everyone, we're very glad you're here today. Um, so the report that you have in your hands, the report that you might have on your smartphones, it contains seven case studies that represent, as you heard, over 50 interviews undertaken across the state of Maine. What's become clear through this uh, undertaking and what you're going to read about is that AI applications have indeed begun proliferating around Maine across healthcare, across education, natural resource industries, in new and creative ways. Um, and these ways are starting to change how those industries are working. Whether it's how fishery catches are counted, how patient outcomes are improved, financial businesses are streamlined, how the next generation of manufacturing technologies uh, enhance productivity, uh, it's clear that Maine's legacy industries are changing and that AI is helping to facilitate that change. We all know that it's essential that what we do helps to grow Maine in ways that are new and exciting while maintaining those things that make Maine special. So we have to do a lot of work to ensure ethical, equitable, and trustworthy AI is deployed in our state. The governor stated, just before the pandemic, our goal to attract 75,000 workers to Maine by 2030 and to grow annual wages by 10%. Without increasing migration to the state, the labor force has begun to face long-term decline. AI is a field into which we can attract and build enabling talent into Maine that crosses all industries in Maine. The thought of the uh, the report is very thought-provoking. Um, I I pull out nuggets every time I read through it, um, but I want to emphasize to you what Usama just said. It's, this is just the baseline. It's highlighting where the opportunities are for the state, but it's only the starting point. So, therefore, we call on you, the community, business leaders, institutions of higher, higher learning, um, to collaborate together across the state to create the future of AI in Maine. Because this is Maine. Here we go. We lead. So, thank you. We're glad you're here today. Um, and I will now uh, introduce our keynote speaker. So today, um, we are pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Amanda Stent, who is the inaugural director of the Davis Institute for AI at Colby College. The author or co-author of more than 100 papers on natural language processing, she's held a number of distinguished research and leadership positions at leading technology companies and universities. She was a, national, a, a natural language processing architect in the chief technology office at Bloomberg, director of research at Yahoo, a principal member of the technical staff at AT&T Labs, and an associate professor in the computer science department at Stony Brook University. With more than 30 patents to her name, Dr. Stent served on the 2020 to 2022 National Academies Committee studying responsible computing research and is now a founding co-editor-in-chief 
of the ACL Rolling Review. It's a great pleasure to welcome Dr. Stan. Uh, thank you, Mike, and welcome, everybody. I am so happy to be here on this lovely day, and aren't we lucky that the room has opened their facility, their gorgeous facility for us, as well as arranging this great report. Uh, this talk is going to be a story in two parts. Uh, can we go to the next slide? Thanks. Uh, first, I will briefly recap the state of AI in general, and then I will summarize the distinctive ways in which Maine is tackling AI. I want to confess, in case it's not obvious from my accent, I'm a Maine transplant, but I do think the culture and beauty of Maine are amazing, so I tried my best to capture what I find so delightful about the state. Okay, so next slide. Near my previous house, there was a museum holding the world's largest collection of automaton. Does anyone know what an automaton is? If you've ever had a musical box or a doll that moves, I found these automata fascinating for three reasons. First, people historically have spent a huge amount of time and effort building mechanical singing birds or mechanical acrobats that can flip. Second, the history of the storage of information is captured in this museum's exhibits, all the way from um, actually storing things in metal up to punch cards and punch tapes, which were used in the early computing devices and eventually led to all the data that we have today. And third, the deep connection between these automata that people have spent so much time building and the historic myths in many of our cultures about creation origins. So let me just tell you briefly one myth. Uh, the one Maya creation story is that the gods wanted to make creatures that would pray to them. So they made creatures out of clay, but they fell apart. So then they made creatures out of wood, but those creatures, although they were sentient and intelligent, wouldn't pray to them. So they sent a flood to destroy them because they were scared that they would be too smart. Does this resonate with anyone today? Um, so, of course, we've all heard of ChatGPT now. Uh, the latest GPT-3 BAT product from OpenAI, I asked ChatGPT to tell me about the state of AI. Of course, really, I was asking it what people on the internet say about the state of AI in 2019. So we can go to the next slide and see what it said. Um, there's a lot of text there I want to summarize. It said that there are new breakthroughs happening all the time, applied in many industries due to increases in data, compute, and uh, advances in machine learning. And there are concerns about the ethical applications of AI. So I want to break down some of those things briefly for all of us as we talk about the state of AI. Uh, next slide. We, of course, do not have to worry that Maine is missing out in the state of AI in general. We are all participants in AI today. Although we have not successfully built humanoids, we have built agents that have their own senses and their own way of acting in the world. In particular, everything that we do online, every time we close our front door and our smart and our smart doorbell senses every time we buy something with a credit card, every time we send or receive an email or interact on Facebook or Instagram, every time we look at a weather forecast, and increasingly every time we apply for a job to buy a house to move somewhere, we are giving AI data into its senses and then it is interacting with us and making decisions. Young people today do not remember a world. So the college students that I just finished teaching in Jan Plans literally do not remember a world before Siri. Do you remember a world before Siri? <laughs> they don't remember a world without machine translation and not just text to text, but you point your camera at a menu and there it is in another language. They do not live in a world where that was not a thing. They don't remember a world without Facebook. They, they don't remember a world without AI. They are the first generation AI. And they are also the first generation to be surveilled at a 1984 scale that has never been seen before in history. These AI applications have become so good for those three simple reasons. Next slide. Massive advances in, not really machine learning, the core algorithms were known since the 1980s, if not before, but massive advances in specialized compute data that either is labeled in itself or by us as we interact with the world, and lots of investor dollars, billions and billions of investor dollars, resulting in 
an incredible centralization, especially over the last four years, and homogenization of AI. Now, what do I mean by that? Let me talk a little bit about that. Five years ago, um, if you use a speech recognizer or turn on closed captions on this talk or a YouTube video, maybe three words out of five would be correct. But big companies were going, oh, we solved AI uh, speech recognition because they got down to 6% word error rate on a data set called Switchboard. Then three years ago, suddenly COVID happened, and all of a sudden we were getting four words out of five correct. Why? Because so many more people were typing in what they were saying, and the machine, learned, the machine was learning from that. And now, nine out of 10 words are correct, at least if you speak with a general American accent. This is incredible progress, given that speech recognition research has been going on for 50 years. 50 years, and in the last five years, we have closed the gap. Speech recognizers are now regularly better than human transcribers. Regularly. Uh, but at what cost? Uh, the development of AI is incredibly unevenly distributed. These speech recognizers that are so good, and we're using one of them now, it's called Whisper, it's amazing, you should try it. But um, it trained for several months on highly specialized compute at the cost of several million dollars. That's one model. They needed maybe 10 engineers to get that set up, but those 10 engineers were very specialized engineers. And then the data came from all of us. Not every company can afford to spend 10, 12 million dollars to train one model to do one piece of thing. Nor do we have access to the compute or data to do that. The data is highly centralized in a small number of companies. Compute is highly centralized in a small number of companies. Most small or medium-sized companies take two to five years to turn from being a traditional company to a data-driven AI company. And all but six months of that is not really machine learning. You have to re-engineer the way data flows through your infrastructure, you have to buy new computers, and you have to change your talent. You systematically have to reinvent yourself as a company. You can't just overlay AI on top of what you're doing. That's why the Entrepreneurship Center at Peru is so beneficial for local companies to help you make that transition. But a lot of companies think they can do it for six months with very little money, and it really is an incredibly expensive and time-consuming process. Deloitte estimates that although 76% of companies are investigating AI, only 24% have successfully deployed AI to production. So how can we help change that game for the state of Maine? Uh, I, want to, I want to actually pause before we go on to that. And can you go to the next slide? Um, there's going to be a little build here, so I'm just going to say things, and whoever the magic wizard is is going to go next, next, next. So I want to acknowledge that all of the illustrations except one in this deck were generated by Dolly. Uh, I am not an artist. I would not have been able to put together these illustrations without Dolly. No chance. Not an artistic bone in my body. Maybe some of you are like me. So that's fantastic, I love it. At the same time, I do want to acknowledge that these AIs are trained on data, especially in the case of a generative um, uh, image generation system, trained on data extracted and mined from humans, and in the development of these AIs, there is often theft of intellectual property and theft of labor. I also want to acknowledge that many AIs so far have been developed without consultation with artists, authors, humanists, psychologists, sociologists, economists, or other relevant stakeholders including the people who live in the places where they will be used. In the application of AI, there are significant risks to individuals, groups, and society at large. And I think that's a challenge that we have to address collectively, and we have the opportunity to lead in that way in Maine. Um, so, let's talk now about the state of AI in Maine. Next slide. I asked ChatGPT, oh yeah, by the way, we still haven't built the humanoids, okay. <laughs> um, I asked ChatGPT about the state of AI in Maine, and the answer was illuminating. Do you want to go ahead? I'm sorry, I don't have any specific information about <laughs> the state of AI in Maine. However, AI research and development is a global effort. It's likely that there are some universities, research institutions involved in AI in some, in some way. Some human wrote this template for every state and then built it in. Um, so, I think that's why we're all here today, is to change that answer. Maybe not in ChatGPT, but in our own lives. Um, and one way we can change that answer uh, is by talking more. This event is a great opportunity. I want to continue the conversation. Um, when I lived in the New York City area, we had a lot of Google groups for different kinds of tech meetups. 
We have set up a Google group called main-ai at googlegroups.com. Nobody owns it, it's not moderated. Feel free to join, feel free to post your jobs, your events. I want to hear all about them, I want to go to all of them. I want other people to hear all about them too. So that's my brief ad here. But in terms of us in Maine, first, as Osama correctly pointed out, the UN, the US, and many other countries around the world agree that two of the most critical challenges facing us are climate change and dem demographic change, along with uh, threats to democracy and freedom. Now, in Maine, we face two of those challenges. We face climate change. The Gulf of Maine is warming faster than anywhere else in the United States. And of course, we are one of the oldest states in the country. So AI can help us effectively address these key challenges. And here we can lead, and it does not take $3 million, $12 million model to start to address these challenges. What it does take is working with stakeholders, using humans along with computers, and um, being careful with the data that we, that we use, that we have in plenty in Maine. So Maine also has some significant advantages in this area, including, in particular for our size, a wealth of research and development talent. We have three independent research labs in Maine that I know of that are profiled in the report, as well as multiple universities and colleges. Uh, and we are increasingly focusing that talent on addressing these key challenges using AI in highly interdisciplinary ways. So let me highlight some of the ones that are profiled in the report. Next slide. Uh, uh, UMaine and Bigelow Labs have been collaborating for several years on this fascinating eDNA project. It's, I just think it's thrilling. And uh, there's the Tandy Center for Ocean Forecasting at Bigelow Labs, and I'm pretty sure I saw Nick Record over there. You can ask him all about it. Uh, there's the Center for Research on Sustainable Forests at UMaine, and Aaron Weiskiller will be talking later this afternoon about that. Uh, there's precision medicine research going on at MDI, the Allen Jacks. It would be impossible without, I hope they agree, it would be impossible without modern machine learning. Um, and there's understanding autism at Colby using multimodal modeling and finding faraway galaxies, and Professor Dale Kosevsky will be talking about that later today. So second, in addition to developing um, AI tool builders, that's interdisciplinary with their own subject matter expertise, but also technical expertise, ability to work with and build AIs. In addition to that, we can also and should have AI tool users. So next slide. There are important and critical advances uh, in Maine going on in the areas of healthcare and life sciences, aquaculture and forestry, financial services, and education and career development. Are we behind in some areas? Yes. Donna Eng and I were talking, she's at Northeastern just, just at lunch, about if we're going to do AI in Maine, we need to improve K-12 education. We cannot have students coming out of high school without even taking algebra and expect to build a machine learning and AI future for Maine. We collectively need to fix this problem. We can't just uh, uh, import all our talent as adults. We need people who are from Maine, grew up in Maine, are educated in Maine, and then go on to become leaders in Maine. Um, uh, but critically, when we come to applying Maine, we don't just have applying AI in Maine, we don't just have technologists. We have product managers, we have designers, we have historians and US experts. All of those people are essential to the successful deployment of AI. And having those people be educated and critical and informed about AI is really important. And that's what we're trying to do at Colby, build the next product managers. My previous role was as a technical product manager. Yes, we need more AI engineers. We can hire all the AI engineers in the world. If we don't have AI informed and AI critical product managers, Terrible products will be built. <laughs> you have no idea. Um, so yes, we need AI-informed and AI-critical product managers, and you will be hearing from CEOs of companies today and other organizations that are really helping us to build that talent pool. Um, so I want to highlight some of those. If you can go to the next slide, you'll be hearing about AI and veterinary medicine at IDEX, which is a place I would love to work at. Come talk to me. Um, <laughs> You'll be hearing about AI in patient care at Maine Health and UNUM. In the report, they talk about AI in aquaculture at New England Marine Mor Monitoring, and AI in forestry at UMaine, and AI in sports at Omnic Data, and um, one that's not profiled in the report, AI for mining, relevant to our electrical future, at Prospector Portal, which is a startup in Waterville. 
Um, these are all exciting opportunities for people who are technology adjacent to really uh, use, effectively use and deploy AI. And it's so exciting to see those developing in Maine. So finally, next slide. Because we have a state with a small population and a relatively lightweight government, or so it seems to me, coming from New Jersey anyway, <laughs> we have the opportunity to lead in the development of AI policies and practices, including education, that respect the rights of individuals and prevent societal harms. For example, in 2019, Maine passed the strongest uh, privacy law in the country, including protections against misuses of facial recognition technology, which is an AI technology. We have the opportunity through the coming implementation of aspects of the AI Bill of Rights from the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy to really make Maine a leader in how to use AI in a way that respects the culture, traditions, and rights of people who live here and around the country. There is no reason, uh, I'm just going to say something bad about California. They have a lot of technologists, so their technologists drive their public policy in certain ways. We don't have to be that way. We can have a better balance. Um, so our senators and Congress people are on important committees where they can help to make those decisions as well, including um, Homeland, Homeland Security and Intelligence. So I want to close, thank you, next slide, by highlighting some of the ways that um, educational institutions in Maine are encouraging everybody to become participants, active participants in how a AI is developed and deployed. Uh, UMaine has an AI initiative. There are some faculty here from that initiative. It's a great initiative. You should sign up for their talk series. We have the Davis Institute for AI at Colby College. Uh, we welcome you to come to our talks, uh, sign up for our hackathons, participate in our career fairs, come have coffee with our students. All of these things are open to everyone in the community. There's a Computing Ethics Narratives project that is joint between Colby and Bowdoin Colleges. And the Root Institute will provide consultation on responsible AI which I think is a phenomenal service for organizations. So um, I, want to, I want to close there. I hope I haven't run over. Uh, last slide. Uh, this is what we're doing at Davis AI. Uh, some of the things that I've talked about are here. This was a picture generated by a college student at Colby in response to what is AI in the lived environment. And uh, finally, next slide. Oh yeah, I keep forgetting. Here's some further reading if you feel like you want to read more. And then finally, I want to really thank the students in our Gen Plan course that we've been teaching for the past three and a half weeks, where we have read a lot of these things and had some of the discussions that led to the thoughts that I have just shared with you. Here are some students participating in our fall data thon that was run with Data IQ. I hope some of them stay in Maine. I want to thank the experiential AI team, and I want to encourage you to join this Google group and share your jobs and your talks and the things you're reading and all the stuff you're doing about AI in Maine. And this picture. I took it. <laughs> <laughs>
event is to come to another event at any college or university in Maine that's working on it, or um, we're going to have a set of resources on our website. But Andrew N runs a great um, one-hour lecture called "What is AI and How Can You Use It in Your Company?" that you can find online on YouTube. Um, and then there's a lot of, and then get involved, read the AI blueprint for an AI bill of rights, and think about it, and how does it affect your life. Download your history from Google or Facebook or Spotify and take a look at what AI has been perceiving about you, and think about what you want to do there. So there are many ways that you can become involved without becoming a computer scientist. Thank you. One more. Uh, the question is about ChatGPT, and as a parent or an educator, do we worry about ChatGPT like ruining our children's ability to think and write? Um, and I have to, I'm going to give credit here. We try not to do anything on our own. I am not a writing instructor, but we have been working at Colby, talking at Colby for the last four months with our writing office and our academic integrity office and our center for teaching and learning, and also reading a lot of what's happening on the internet. Um, yes, people can plagiarize with another student. They can plagiarize with ChatGPT. If they want to cheat, they're going to cheat. However, ChatGPT can provide several really useful things for students of any age. Help you get started. Brainstorming. Especially if you know it's not telling the truth. I asked ChatGPT last week to tell me the truth. Literally, please tell me the truth. And then, what is the answer to life, the universe, and everything? And it said, 42. <laughs> <laughs> so, teach them not to trust it. Let them use it for brainstorming. Let them use it for scaffolding and get them engaged in editing the output of ChatGPT or any one of these other AI writing assistants. In these ways, you can still learn to write and think, and you're doing it in ways that really fit with the workforce you're going to be going into. Those are some of our suggestions. Terrific. We'll take a couple more. One or two more. Sure. There are very real risks with the uses and applications of AI. So my first approach, yes, yeah, sorry, sorry, the question was how do we deal with resistance to the application of AI in areas like education and, and uh, medical devices? And I think there are very real risks, so I would start by listening to the concerns of your other stakeholders. You cannot lose, you can only win when you listen to more voices. <coughs> After you've listened to their concerns, maybe there's something very real there that you need to take on board. And the mere fact of listening, deeply listening, causes acceptance of, and, and engagement with you about what may or may not be going to happen. I'm, I'm sure that they, I hope they teach doctors this. Certainly in the classroom, we learn to listen to our students' needs before we attempt to just like storm over them. And I think this is what Osama was talking about when he talks about experiential AI. It's human assisted by AI and AI assisted by humans. And really the two have to go together. Um, if you listen to their concerns and there is a real concern, then you deal with it. If there isn't a real concern, then maybe it's some um, material that you can use for, for people in the future. But quite often, as with ChatGPT, I think people, they first see it, and then they, they, they go through the three stages of AI grief, okay? <laughs> which is shock, horror, and acceptance. Right? So you have to let them get through shock and horror before they get to acceptance. And maybe along the way, you learn something useful. <laughs> Terrific. And with that, let's thank Dr. Santa for a great <laughs>
truly an outstanding panel of uh, the leaders of some of the most exciting companies who operate, of course, in Maine, but also have a, a national uh, and, in some cases, beyond uh, footprint. So, um, our goal of this panel is to really give you a feel for two things. How are these companies thinking about AI and how do they use it? And, and hopefully they'll be sharing with us some uh, case studies of where they use it and how it's important to their business. So that's one dimension. The second one is, what about talent? How do they find talent? How do they retain it? What does the state and what do we all, educational institutions, other organizations need to do to make sure they have that talent they need that will help us hopefully lead in AI um, out of the state in certain areas. So with that, uh, I'll uh, do the introductions by actually asking each of the leaders to introduce themselves. Um, I'll start out, I guess Steve is ready, so uh, <laughs> Steve Smith is the uh, CEO of LLB. Can you spend, I'm giving, by the way, it's a lot of CEOs, and one hour total, and we want to leave 10 minutes for Q&A. <laughs> they only have two minutes each to tell you who they are and what does their company do. So I'm Steve Smith. I was born in Austin. <laughs> President and CEO of L.B. for the past seven years. L.B. based here in Maine, about just under $2 billion in sales, about 70% e-commerce, uh, with about 5,000 full-time employees, uh, and we hired just 4,000 during our peak season, November and December. And uh, yeah, you know L.B. can sell a lot of stuff. <laughs> and he's wearing it. <laughs> um, next is uh, Bob Montgomery Rice, uh, who's the CEO of uh, Bangor Savings. Hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Bob Montgomery Rice, CEO and President of Bangor Savings Bank. We are the largest <coughs> bank headquartered in northern New England. We have 1,100 employees. We have customers in Maine, but also every state in this country, as well as we have uh, customers who have immigrated to 147 different countries. We service them day to day. Um, and so I get the privilege to lead that organization. Next is Melissa Smith, uh, CEO of Wex. Hi, I'm Melissa Smith. I'm CEO of Wex. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Wex is a financial technology platform, or global. We have about 6,000 employees all over the world. And we are in about size, you know, when I first joined Vex, we were about 50 million in revenue. Last year, we're estimated around 2.3 billion. So growth is important to us. I'm Josh. Okay, go for it. <laughs> <laughs> keep driving on. I, I'm Josh Broder. I'm the CEO of Tilson, and we're on a mission to build America's information infrastructure. And for us, that means we do all the things necessary to connect data centers to computers and phones out in the world. So all the all the physicality of the internet is, is what we do. And we're about 1,000 employees working nationally, and uh, we'll roughly double that size this year. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Fishbein, president of Sun Life US. Sun Life is a global insurance company based in Toronto. But here in the US, uh, the business I lead, we have about uh, 6,000 employees located across the country, including 500 here in the greater Portland area. Coincidentally, we are planning on moving into a building next door in a few months. Uh, and although we do business nationally and have offices all over the place, I'm based here in Maine and have lived here for 28 years, so I'm still from away. Uh, <laughs> our business is, uh, in the US, it's primarily employee benefits. So group life, disability, voluntary products, dental insurance, uh, stop loss. Thanks. Mike Simons, I'm with Unum, and we are, I, I was actually a grad at Scarborough High School, but also not born here, so I'm still from away there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're about 11,000 uh, people, primarily in the US, but also UK and Europe. Um, we cover about 45 million workers and their families through about 138,000 employer clients. Excellent. So thank you all for, for coming and uh, 
Uh, let's launch into it. I'm going to have directed questions at each panelist, uh, and then we'll uh, open it up for general Q&A. Let me start with uh, Dan Fishbach of Sunlight. We have uh, worked, actually the Institute for Expansion AI and the Rue Institute worked with Sunlight on a project that covered the whole spectrum from identifying opportunities for AI in their business to picking a project and working on it to running a course in parallel. And I would say Sunlight for our students and our learners, uh, Sunlight went a step further and said, we're sending actuaries into this course because we want them to understand what this data science and AI is all about. So I, I kind of love that project that they also gave us permission to talk about it publicly, which is great. Um, so um, could you share with us a major case study of an initiative that is important to your company's core business that kind of involves AI? Yeah, and we, and we have quite a bit going on, a number of different initiatives using AI right now. By the way, thanks for the comment about actuaries, because when we talk about data scientists, the insurance industry invented that. It's called being an actuary. <laughs> uh, but you know, there was a very important element there. Actuaries are very, very well trained in understanding how to use and manipulate data, but maybe not in some of the most uh, you know, contemporary uh, programs to organize and structure that data. So training, our, you know, we have over 100 actuaries in our company, and training actuaries to use uh, contemporary data science is a huge opportunity for the industry and anybody in the educational side working on uh, data science. Uh, one of the initiatives that I'll just briefly highlight that we're working on that uses AI is in our disability insurance uh, business. So uh, if you're a disability insurer, you have claimants who are out of work either for short term or long term uh, because of an illness or injury. And you have a limited number of resources, limited amount of resources to apply to working with those people to help get them back to work. And you can't necessarily interact with each of them in the same level of intensity. So we have to figure out where do we aim the resources so that we get the best impact, the people who are you know, can be helped to get back to work, who want to get back to work, who are amenable to using the resources that are available. AI is a perfect answer, potentially, to that question. There's massive amounts of data that we have, much of it unstructured. For example, we take all of the phone interactions that we have with people. So we have an initiative right now working both the, somewhat with the Rue Institute, our own people, and an outside firm where we are listening to all those phone calls and then codifying all of that data and using things like tone of conversations even, frequency of conversations, and some of the content of those conversations to say, wait a minute, here's somebody that maybe you should be applying a different kind of approach to or a different level of intensity to because this is somebody who could get back to work and who maybe wants to get back to work. So that's just an example. There are certainly many others. Great, thank you. If I may move to Steve. Um, as a retailer with significant physical and online presence, what are some of the ways you are using AI? Could the supply chain, for example, would that be the most significant use case for AI? Or? Yeah, I can definitely, uh, from a supply chain perspective, um, we have about 80,000 SKUs, individual products, and on an annual basis, we move about 30 million individual units. And our forecasting team, I think for a long time, has been using machine learning. Our systems, in partnership with Blue Yonder, we look at three years of historical data, of movement of every single product by color, by size, by channel, and then apply a recency factor to that and are then making our forecast for future purchasing. And to what you described earlier, which I loved, which was AI-assisted human intelligence or human-assisted uh, computer intelligence, we take all that data and then our data scientists apply additional pieces of data that the systems don't know, like there was a snowstorm, it was cold, it was hot, a catalog was early, it was late, uh, Google search terms were more or less expensive, whatever those things are that the system may not know, we enter that into our systems. The promise for, and all of that is algorithmic driven, the promise for us is 
to continue to have that structured data get into the system so that we are able to um, be much more predictive in those models and much more precise. And if we can put more data into those algorithms um, and we can see patterns that, that we can't find now. Is there an intricacy of that data that the computer systems can pick up that will show us a different pattern? And we need humans to then be looking at that, that level of data. So supply chain is hugely sophisticated for us. Uh, we're talking, you know, it's our single largest asset, $600 million a year that we spend on, on supply chain. The more sophisticated we can be, the more intelligent we can be, the better off. Um, so that's, that's definitely one major use case for us, and we have a practicum that we're working on with you around that same topic. And I, I love that example because it involves the humans in that. Um, turning over to Melissa, uh, you said something last week, Melissa, that really stuck in my mind. You said AI is more than nice to have, it is an imperative. Which, you know, hearing it from a CEO, like makes my heart happy. <laughs> <laughs> Can you elaborate on what leads you to this strong statement? Um, and you know, how is AI changing your industry? And sure, I am a hater. I think we've all seen what uh, changes can do both positively and negatively in the world. And AI to me has gone through a lot of change, but in particular over the last year, you can see that it is becoming more democratized and the fact costs are coming down, the ability to have it embedded in uh, apps that you purchase has gone up. And so I think that rate of change is only increasing. And so you're gonna either be part of that or you're gonna be left behind. And I'd like to be on the forefront of that. And the way that we're thinking about that, um, it's also a great mode if you can combine your data set if you're an existing company with AI, um, you talked about that earlier, but uh, it really creates competitive advantage. We have about $600 million a day in transaction volume going through our business. That's just richness of data. I think McKinsey called it uh, raw material for a company like ours. And so if you can take that data, combine it with the relationships we have with over 800,000 customers, it's, it's magic and we're deploying it in a couple of places now, but we see this as an arc. So we've got in-flight products right now that do things like help predict what's going to happen uh, within customer behavior patterns and what's happening externally so that we can increase credit lines. We've got about $3 billion worth of receivables sitting our balance sheet, but we want to be intuitive about that so we know what customers we should be extending more credit to. We're doing that now and that arc for us is going up into using that with other behavioral data so that we can be more anticipatory of what our customers need, which we think will reduce the cost, but also increase the intimacy of the relationships we have with our customers. So I, I think that the game is just you know beginning to change and it's going to accelerate. Great. Um, turning next door to Bob. Um, you know, we, we had the opportunity uh, to work with Banker Savings Bank with our AI solutions help here. Um, with your team, and we admire their focus on customer experience and customer trust, above all other considerations, which is a, an amazing culture. What role does AI play in achieving that, and what else do you do with your work? Yeah, so let me take that a little bit even further. You know, we're extremely customer-centric. Uh, to the point, and, and we've been recognized industry-wide for the last decade for that by J.D. Power. But one of the challenges we've had is that customers, when you become their trusted advisor, they want you to start to tell them their next move. But not in sell them their next product, but really help them manage their life. And so, as Melissa shared, as a financial company, you have a lot of rich data. But a lot of times that data is not used, but AI is allowing us now and we've developed, um, with your help, a recommendation engine. So that we're taking all of that data and computing it and now providing it to, whether it's our teller or CSR or a person out in the field, where that person that they're talking to is most likely in their life stage. Not what product to sell them, but where are they most likely at so that then when they have a conversation, they can have a very rich conversation and really become that true advisor and really help that customer understand what might be the next best thing they do or not do. 
And so that's where, when you are a customer-centric organization, that's the nirvana you can get to. And you know, we've talked about it a long time at our company and in the, inside the industry. And it's been something that's been elusive for us, but AI has really closed that gate, uh, that gap for us. And um, being able to buy that data in their mobile tablet for those people uh, is, is just amazing. Uh, and it's going to really dramatically transform them and tighten those relationships with our customers. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, not, not only a rich conversation, but a relevant one. That's very, very important. Um, turning to Josh, um, you have built Tilson from a small business to a national one, still with a significant significant presence in Maine. How has the business environment changed over the last 15 years for a technology company in Maine? What do you think Maine's advantage can be in attracting more tech so our, our talent is uh, distributed nationally, but Maine remains our largest location. And one of the challenges we've had over the years is that as we try to do the work that we do um, for big telecom carriers and urban places, it's been uh, that the work that we do is not very affordable for small carriers in rural places. Like the project. And so AI has taken the cost of designing a community at the conceptual level, uh, the broadband network in a, in a community, from about a million dollars to about 40 million uh, in the past four years. Um, and once you get to the $40,000 price point, then you need to get it really fully designed so that you can go permit it and build it. And now you start getting back into the millions of dollars. And so you get approached by vendors, and they say, hey, we figure that out. We can automate that. I say, great, I've got a building full of mayors doing engineering and CAD drafting and GIS work and other conceptual design. And how would you do it? And they'd say, I was talking to an Australian company the last time we had this conversation. They said, well, we have maps uh, that do it. And, uh, and I said, well, how much does it cost? And they told me how much it costs. And I said, that's like 80% of what it costs us. So like, how do you really do it? And they said, well, we do a long end in the Philippines. Mm. And I said, well, that's not really AI. That's, <laughs> that's, just, that's just a pie. <laughs> <laughs> and so the, the, short, the, the short answer to your question is I don't really know. Um, I, I know that fundamentally the thing we do will be deeply disrupted by AI and will be disrupted in a positive way that will make the thing we do more affordable and accessible to other people. And so I have no idea where it's going, and I don't even know how we're gonna get from here to there. And so we're focused on the fundamental activity, which is starting to track the data in this manual expensive work so that we have something to innovate on top of. And put some people in the Rue Institute so that they can tell us how to do it. <laughs> 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 Um, let's turn off, oh, Mike, uh, so a question to you. Your team has been <laughs> deeply engaged with the Rue Institute in many projects. How big of a role is AI playing in your industry, and do you think it's possible to build sustainable competitive advantage if you are a leader in using advanced technologies, such as Thanks. So, really, two parts of the question. Yeah. Um, the opportunity in the industry, and then can you actually sustain it? Right, which is important to me because I have a big competitor that's right next to me. Your boss. So, you know, on the first one, and I thought the report did a good job of, highlight, of not only holding your microphone, but also highlighting, you know, some of the risks associated with it. And I'm thinking my comments to be more like, well, what's the human upside of it? And, you know, I would take you back uh, to COVID and the peak of COVID. So what we, we do is we, our customer is the average kind of working person. About 60% of them live paycheck to paycheck, which means they don't get paid, they don't make rent, basically. Yeah. So when COVID hit, and you know, take like, a pick a calendar year, so in 2021, we, we, we saw $100 million more life insurance claims come through, only because of COVID. We saw 600,000 
more people go out on this bill. You know, it couldn't, it couldn't show up for it. 700,000 people out on the move, right? And this is while our workforce was dealing with the same problems, the same issues, same challenges, transitioning to home. And so some of the things that um, AI enabled were just very, very simple things that proved to be so incredibly important in terms of like a reasonably existing firm. So the ability to sort of ingest unstructured data, and I saw Maine Health is here as a fantastic organization. Medical records do not come through in a particularly good structured way. We're trying to figure out you know, who's out of work and make sure that they get those paychecks, Danny. Um, I know you're working on it. Uh, still a lot of physicians, notes that are handwritten. Um, so just you know, really good uh, but basic technology that helps us to, to take in that mass of claims from the and turn it around you know, that quickly. And then a little bit further in, you go uh, into the machine learning and then into some of the deeper models that are there. Let, let, let us do eligibility all the way through. So understand, make sure that they are employed, and they've been employed for the time to be benefit eligible, and then make some initial uh, decisions around the duration of the benefit. Uh, so all those things, are things like even in a normal time might take you know, weeks to get all done. They become one of days and hours to get done and be able to handle that kind of volume. So I think uh, the potential is huge. And, and Dan highlighted once on claim the ability to target resources to return uh, people resource, uh, to uh, work, which is huge. And the competitive advantage, um, I think it is really about, like what we were talking about, a number of, of the folks up here, is like, it's the combination. So any firm has to pick, like, what's your core competence? What are you going to compete on? If you're going to be sustainable, you have to pick one or two things that you're doing really, really good. And, you know, for for us, it's, in, it's employee benefits and helping people that get sick or hurt, basically. And um, I was actually looking across the room, and I don't know if he's still here, but John Ross is, uh, John Ross in the room? Oh, you moved. There you go. Yes. He's a very um, smile. He's definitely one of the happiest people I know. <laughs> and um, I think, John, if I miss well, let me know. But I started as a disability benefit specialist about 15 years ago. You know, we just learned firsthand what it meant to take care of people when they consider hurt. And I remember running into him at the gym at Unum. And he, uh, at some point, was a big, went back to school and started um, getting graduate degrees. And now he's you know, data and analytics and helping progress, you know, progress our AI practice. It's really that combination of um, you know, narrowing on a confidence, leverage the talent that you have, and apply it you know, to lead you in a sustainable way. All right, so let's shift gears and now talk some about uh, talent. And at this point, I'm going to ask everybody to try to stick to the two-minute answer. We're <laughs> <laughs> running out of time. Um, Melissa. You mentioned some significant growth anticipated in your data science team at Wax. How do you plan to achieve that? And how do you balance kind of incoming fresh talent with experienced talent that understand the domain and the problem? Yes, but so we're going to double the data science and in the course of, of this year from um, what we've had historically. And I'm guessing, again, that's an arc that will continue. Uh, but I think it, equally importantly, we've uh, done a class work of education here for, uh, we call it a data class, where we're taking people in the business and educating them about artificial intelligence and, and data science. And we think that that's equally important. We've also got an artificial intelligence center of excellence that's got set up, which is again, the purpose of that is really more educating people and bringing them into what's happening. And we've had for a couple of years uh, a governance committee that is really making sure ethically that we're doing the right thing. So when I think about the, the resources, it's the buildup of the internal resources, but also circles of education. And, and again, making sure from a compliance and an ethics perspective, we're using the tools in the way that we intend to. Uh, let me go to Dan, first part. <coughs> You know, you talked about the original data scientists being the uh, actuaries. Uh, how do you think about evolving and augmenting this talent pool to more effectively leverage new AI methods in data science? Well, first let me mention, you know, especially with Mike sitting next to me, something that's probably not well known. But there's a cluster here in the greater Portland area of disability insurance. This is the largest market in the world 
for disability insurance professionals. In fact, there's six or seven companies here uh, and more than 5,000 people in the greater Portland area who work in disability insurance on all the same kinds of things that both Mike and I were talking about. And there's numerous examples of the way, of ways that AI can make that a better experience for the member getting back to work, for the employer, for the, for the insurer. So I think there's a great opportunity, you know, and we're both doing it, and I think other companies should as well, for partnering with Root to educate our own employees in the, the principles of data science and the application uh, of artificial intelligence. So I think that's something for us all to think about, maybe even as you know, partners, is what can we do more broadly with the disability insurance cluster that exists here? Very good. Steve. Uh, last week we were talking uh, about emergent talent needs in your business when it comes to being data driven. You actually talked about the fascinating concept of a new type of operator, to use your words. Uh, how does being a main based business make this kind of talent need unique? Yeah, so uh, last week when we were chatting, it was, you know, we generally, for our business, we think about operations and operators, we think about frontline supervisors in manufacturing and fulfillment uh, in our stores. And you know, what's really apparent with our use of data, whether it's in our marketing team or supply chain team, is we need people who are able to operate with data. Um, and so earlier, looking for pattern recognition, being comfortable with complex data, um, and thinking about them as operators. You know, they're people who are generating insights and then moving them through the organization and the business. Um, and it can be a huge um, competitive advantage for us. And here, specifically, you know, with you and with Ru, we think about our employees. So we have a number of our employees who are taking classes here, learning, getting comfortable with data. There's so much about demystifying uh, machine learning, AI, getting comfortable with data, getting comfortable with complexity. We have employees who are teaching classes in partnership with your faculty, um, and then we have Rue and Northeastern students coming into our business. And I think that crossover ultimately is about training, retaining, training, retraining, retaining um, our employees so that they are uh, ready for whatever's next uh, on their lives and their career. So um, all of that is around getting comfortable with data and operating in data, not just having it be something that's mystical, it's actually generating insights and then it's turning into putting products in the customer's hands. That's great, great. Bob, um, I know for Better Savings Bank, you, know, you have the perspective that upskilling the employees is also important for employee retention. How do you go about developing effective upskilling programs in AI? How are you guys thinking about that? So, you know, we, in Maine, we have just a limited amount of labor, so you better be thinking about how you upscale them. And, and also to take the edge or threat of AI out of the workplace. And so, as you are, you know, not only doing things that Steve mentioned about having uh, people come to the room, whether it's for degree programs or actually a course or certificate or just a learning, um, then thinking about the jobs that are at the more basic level and as you are moving through that, how do you take their skill sets and move them along, get them to have better appreciation for data? You know, all of this is dependent that we have true and accurate data sitting in our systems. So if you have a customer service rep, you then them trained about what data is, why it's important, then we're going to make good decisions. If you don't do that, bad data is bad decisions. And so your entire workforce and, and uh, investing into their education around AI is really important. And, and frankly, it's a threat if you don't take it real serious. Excellent. Um, let me turn over to Josh. Um, you know, Tilson's stated mission is to build American information infrastructure. Uh, how do data and AI play into that, especially with meaning? So one of the things that is a challenge for our business is that every day we solve the same problem over again. Mm -hmm. Uh, and every day we watch the knowledge of how we solved it spill on the floor and trickle between the floor for us. <laughs> um, and then we get up in the morning and we do it again. Um, and so because the thing we do is so expensive, um, imagine you're in uh, a city in Wyoming, a city that's four size, and doesn't have any telephone calls, and you have to get 
a fiber network under the sea. And it's the first time they're going to have that network, but it's not the first time people will put stuff underground, gas line, sewer line, and everything else. And so all day long, really bright, really experienced people go outside and take a lay of the land and get some data, create some data, and make an assessment and figure out where they can thread that needle um, through the ground. And when we get it wrong, we hit something that explodes. It's explodes. So for us, I think that the challenge for us is, is at multiple echelons. It, it's, it's obvious that the root learners we have that one are our systems team in time will help us really think about the structure late. Um, but out in the field, I think we still are trying to figure out how do we sensitize a workforce that's gained their knowledge through hard one experience over the years to the value of that data and the capture of that activity of solving the problem so we can do something right. So we want to figure out how to train them at that. And somewhere in the middle, we're focused on education around analytics because we think ultimately we're unlikely to do a lot of fundamental research and development around AI for the applied apps, right? So um, we're going to buy stuff. But we think people with an analysis vocabulary and understanding of data will wind up being the users who will really figure out how to make AI seem for us when they buy those products. And the final question around Alan is to Mike Simmons. How do you build a data driven culture and ensure the entire organization is using data effectively, not just kind of the elite, isolated data science? Mm -hmm. Easy question. <laughs> I think you really nailed it. I think you, I mean, you really have to start with just based on understanding why the data is really important because it's often sourced and people distribute it all over the organization. Did you say bad data, bad decisions? Um, yeah, I think you have to role model as leaders, like that you're going to face decisions on on good data and take the time to do that. Um, be a student, you know, ourselves, and have that expectation of other than Everybody on this panel has spent a lot of time. You know, as things change, you got to stay current. So I think you know, all those things are you know, You've got to hang around the room as much as oh, yeah. possible. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So right now is the kind of closing part, and it's the rapid fire portion here. <laughs> so now in less than a minute, I would like each of you to provide a concise Less than a minute. <laughs> As you think beyond your company and the future of the economy and education ecosystem in Maine, why is AI, from your perspective, something the state should be seriously thinking about? And I don't know whether we want to start left or right. Maybe we'll start with Steve, put you on the spot. Less than a minute, I'm going to time it. Okay. We've been right on time. Yeah. We've been yeah. on time. <laughs> so, a couple things really simply. So Maine was a net loser of population pre-COVID. We now have a positive population. But if we go back to those trends, we are the oldest states, uh, the oldest workforce, and hopefully we can hang on to our population. But we need to make sure that we can attract and retain young people to the state to begin their careers. That's critical for the state. And then for our existing workforce to continue to upskill them we all have, everybody up here has very successful businesses with huge population uh, employee bases here in the state. And the more that we can upskill them to make our businesses even better competitively, so we're more successful economically, that's good for the state. So we need more people coming in and our existing people more well trained. AI, ML, data fluency, all critically important to that. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, as the banker, it's always about the economy, right? And everything we do actually has a big impact. So Steve mentioned labor. Um, that's the most critical thing, keeping that skilled up. And if we can, for once, lead like, with something, Maine will then lead the state when it comes to the economy and the growth of AI. And so it is really exciting that the root is here in Portland and Fort Maine to lead and help us transform the state and lead through what is really important to the future. Wonderful. 40 seconds. Uh, I'll get them on that. So, uh, this idea of leadership, it, it, we can't hire the type of talent that we're talking about anywhere in the world. I mean, it's, it's really hard to find uh, rich data scientists 
And we have this opportunity here in the state of Maine. That's why I was so excited when the Brew Institute was established to be leaders, not just in the state, but actually in the world with really putting all our effort together uh, towards AI and all of these higher education tools. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so, and by the way, I would add that... Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm going to add to what Melissa said. You may or may not know, but Melissa and Wax are our landlord right now. <laughs> Right. I'll, I'll borrow a page from chat GTP, which is to steal other ideas without citing them. <laughs> but because where you're sitting, you'll know who said this. Uh, you know, opportunity uh, is concentrated, but talent is distributed. And um, if we want to take advantage of the talent that we have, it seems like AI offers a fantastic payback for the investment. Mm -hmm. For relatively low offer, we can create a ton of value. Great. Yeah. So I agree with it, everything that's already been said. So what I'll do is I'll add something which also borrows from somebody else. So Angus King, yeah, in it would have been 1996, uh, uh, came to a grand opening of an office uh, that I was at in Portland that had a grand total of 10 people. So it showed you, you know, what he was anticipating. And he said the following, in the future, people will work where they live instead of live where they work. Now is the future. That future is here. That was very prescient on his part. There's no better place to live than Maine. So there's no reason why we can't become uh, a center of AI or anything else that we want. Uh, I have a group of new neighbors where I live, and they all came from someplace else in the, since the pandemic began and brought their jobs with them. Agreed. I'll go on Dan's point of why I think Maine should be and can be a leader, and I think Maine is an attractive place, but that's a great reason, Dan. Uh, I regrettably, I'll tell you that was a great reason, because you're a competitor of mine. <laughs> uh, the other one is like, and it's, uh, you can see on this um, panel here and people that are in the room, um, there's, we have businesses that take us you know, all over, right? Uh, I think Maine's special. And I think there's just an ethos. Maybe it's because of the long cold winters, or maybe it's the size of it, but um, there is an element of just community. So rather than independent, you know, organization, educational, healthcare, you know, business, just a nat you don't have to drag us into it. It's like a natural inclination for us to work together to accomplish it. So I think that's a lot of reason for all. Thank you. And by the way, watching the clock, we're actually two, two minutes ahead. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this actually opens us up. Right now, we're going to have 10 minutes of QA. So, please, if you have questions. I don't know, team, I would love it if it was a microphone so we don't have to repeat questions. You can get it. But while we think about how to get a microphone into the audience, we have to get questions from online. I'm going to go kind of off script and off piece. Uh, all of you know about me and health, right? You know who Main Health is? So, we, we are honored to have the CEO uh, of, of Main Health here, and I'm going to just impose on him, put him on the spot. Come on up, Andy, please. <laughs> he joined us yesterday for dinner, and he kind of blew my mind with some of the ideas for AI in his business. But, you know, you don't get more than one or two minutes. <laughs> But tell us, like, how do you think about AI in your business? Sorry. Yeah, how do you think about AI in your business? Yeah, it's, it's, it's going to be critical to us. And I think it goes back to the labor question around the fact that we're going to struggle to generate enough individuals to do the jobs that we need to provide care for the community, but not providing that care is not an option. So one of the things that is really we've started to struggle with is really the interaction with patients in the electronic health record. And that became increasingly important in the pandemic when you weren't able to physically necessarily go to the physician's office. But since that time, our physicians, nurse practitioners, physicians assistants are really overwhelmed by the amount of information people were requesting through that. It's burning them out, it's creating frustration for them, and it's really consuming a lot of their time that prevents them from caring for all the patients that we need to. And so, yeah, Sam and I were talking last night just about the huge opportunity to think about using NLP to really help go through that data that they're all receiving 
And if nothing else, help prioritize. What is the best next action to help improve the life of a patient? And so I think we're going to have to continue to think about how we can really employ that to ensure that we're, we're able to deliver the, the amount of care that we're going to be you know, asked to do. Thank you very much, Andy. <laughs> accepting the challenge. Uh, number one, when he says Sam, he's talking about Sam Scarpino, who heads up our AI for life sciences and utilizes a lot of the NLP technology. And so we have all of the uh, NLP technology uh, Number two is uh, we, we promised the, the question session, and I saw one question here. So I don't know if we can get a, a mic over here. But I while, over. Okay, while the mic is walking over, uh, I'm a weird guy. When a CEO of a major health delivery system says NLP, it just gives me a thrill. <laughs> right. Do we have a mic? I already asked one question, so I'll skip to 30 seconds. Um, I'm interested in hearing about machine learning governance, AI governance, and making sure that when you deal with customers in particular, you're ensuring you know the side measure from a compliance perspective, from a privacy perspective. Be especially interested in hearing from Steve, given the inherent loyalty of developing customers. Yeah. And, and for the benefit of the audience, just identify yourself. Oh, Kevin Petrie. I'm with uh, Eggerson Group, which is a research and consulting firm focused on data lives. Thank you. And the question was around uh, data governance. So, um, I, let me talk about data governance, not around the AI and ML governance. So, for us, um, we have a precious customer database of 40 million um, uh, customer records. And our data governance is really serious. And it is our chief legal counsel, our, our CIO and our chief marketing officer and our database sits within our marketing organization. Um, and they have a, a very formal data governance process that they go through any decisions we're making around our database, any use, we don't sell any of our data. Um, and then it actually reports into our audit committee officially. Um, so we have a report out on data governance, data quality, data cleansing and all that. Um, and so very, very active uh, management and protection of that data. There's nothing more important to us than that. And we're actually in the process of um, creating an entire, moving our entire customer database from mainframe to cloud technology in the next two years. It is just a massive undertaking. And uh, so, this is something we take really, really seriously. Any mining of our data through AI or ML is done in house uh, through our own, with our own data scientists. Okay. Anybody else on the panel prepared to talk about any AI government or data government? Uh, Oh, that. I'll just add one quick thing. We, we established a set of data principles a few years ago and made it a major effort to make sure every employee in the company globally knew what they were. But one key principle we decided on, this was subject of a lot of debate, that was, was that we would never sell our data. So we use our data and keep it strictly confidential, uh, but we don't sell it. Other questions to the audience? I would just add, just that I think we've all touched upon this. Governance is important to all of us when it comes to doing this. And then the piece about privacy and really making sure that if you tr are trusted by your customers, that you're not going to sell that data when you use it on top of it. Uh, and you involve all levels of the company from board on down. And then just to the, to the AI piece of what you do with that data, I think a couple things more. But bias is something you have to watch really, really hard. So up to, uh, to the rue that we've been working with on establishing really good methods to ensure that, or do the best you can to ensure that you're not introducing unintentional uh, bias into the models and reinforcing things uh, that, that you don't uh, want to reinforce. And that's certainly something you and thank you, Mike, for the plug. And we do have a responsible AI practice who engages on the ethical <laughs> issues and helping the companies. Part of it is we're trying to figure out what we should be teaching the next generation. And part of it is delivering that valuable service. Question? And identify yourself. Hi, I'm Savannah Bono. Oh. Okay. <laughs> I'm Savannah Bono. I'm a 
Yeah. I'm Giovanna Vitoboni. I am the Dean of the College of Engineering at the University of Maine, Arno. Uh, so if you were granted the wish <coughs> that your data scientists have when they come in, like a skill or a quality, what would that be? Critical thinking skills. Um, the ability to track data and do things with it is just incredibly powerful and moving and it quickly. But ultimately, our ability to make use of it is only as good as the critical thinking skills that are applied uh, to that data. So I, I just think at the primary education level and then at every level there, we, we'd love to see. And I'd add to that critical thinking skills, but business relevance, which is probably like another click on that same idea, that uh, to the extent that they understand business, that is really helpful. Uh, communication skills, I mean, almost always it's going to be collaborative efforts, so that, you know, really, really good listening skills, as well as the ability to sort of influence. Yeah, build on those communication skills, be engaging and really uh, engage the, the workers who are using the data and understanding, coming from a place of understanding with them. That should be easy. If you can just get all of that. <laughs> <laughs> and we can actually use it by second quarter. <laughs> all, all that within engineering. <laughs> so uh, I saw questions here. Because Yes. My name is Anupit Kohli. I'm a faculty in operation and supply chain at the University of Solomon. And my question is, with all the happening in between uh, AI in cloud versus AI at edge, so what are your thoughts about uh, the approach that it should be either odd or hybrid approach? Ooh, a technical question. Uh, so the question is, <laughs> doing AI, inference or analysis in the cloud versus doing it at the edge, meaning primarily collect the data. If any of you care to uh, step I can, up. I can talk a little bit about that because we built some of the edge infrastructure. Um, and the reason we're building edge infrastructure, this is moving compute closer to where the action is, to where people are interact acting with computers and the devices. Um, is that the networks that we build um, have latency. They don't operate in real time. It takes time to get from A to B. And so I, I think we are at the very beginning, the earliest days of the emergence of applications that are sensitive to this latency, this delay. Uh, and so having having those decisions action closer to where the users are, I think will become increasingly important. It was the promise of 5G. It hasn't happened yet. But it's happening. It's the early days of this. And I think it will become increasingly relevant. And I will tell you, from an infrastructure investment standpoint, we, we are on the other side of uh, organizations investing billions of dollars in making sure that that edge infrastructure exists. And so big bets being made on this, the need for that infrastructure today. The other answers? We'll move to the next question. So as, as the uh, executive director of the Institute for Experiential AI, my answer is, do it in the cloud, do it in the edge, do it in the fog in between, do it frequently, and do lots of it. Okay, two more questions. Are we here? Here's oh, there's one there already, and then. Uh, hey, uh, Tom Law, I'm with National Instruments at Beth Newton Drive. Uh, I guess this came up earlier, but I think Maine is in kind of a unique position where main companies care about privacy. And that's potentially a big planning opportunity, especially if we do something with policy. Uh, can you talk a little bit about thoughts on that? Well, easy questions. <laughs> Anybody want to think? I think, Steve, you talked some about the privacy and the government. Yeah. But what about policy? I don't really know how to answer that. I mean, so data privacy is a huge issue for us, California is leading data privacy with their Data Privacy Act, which has forced all e-commerce businesses to really change uh, how customers can access their data, they can, uh, they can delete their data, they have the right to be forgotten, they have the right to review all of their data. Um, and so when their privacy, CCPA went through, we all had to adapt to that standard. Now every state is creating their own new privacy and Maine's um, is coming through as well. Maine's is less um, 
aggressive than, than California, so it's fairly easy to, to apply. Um, so, sorry, I'm not advanced about Maine leading on this. What we are wishing for is actually a federal solution to this. Yeah, <laughs> Um, because it's incredibly difficult. You have to see where a customer's coming from and then present different, um, different um, screens to them uh, through the e-commerce environment, depending on the state they're coming through. And they're all different, and we have to manage through all of those, and it's actually quite labor-intensive. So we would love to have a federal standard, a high, very high federal standard, and follow California if you want. I'm not sure if it's an area where Maine can lead, or, um, but it's, a, it's an area of... of High annoyance. <laughs> I guess, can I clarify a little bit? I guess what I meant is there's a difference. What I meant is that I think there's a difference between compliance and kind of uh, what people want to do. And there's an opportunity where I think mayors care about that privacy, not just compliance. As, as, as an example, main banning the use of facial recognition technology in public places, you know, I'll try to fix would be, that would definitely be needed, everything. But I don't know, any answer? <laughs> Otherwise, we are. Well, I, I would say that that is hard. I, the way that I think that it just introduces a lot of complexity from a business perspective. So we're sitting on the other side of that saying, like from a global perspective, you introduce even more um, standards. And the way that, that we're thinking about that is almost you take the, the hardest one, and that you deploy that as your minimal standard across to try to simplify as much as you can. And you know, simplification just makes things better from uh, the end user perspective too. And I, when you think about Maine, I think Maine has led in many different ways. And I, but I don't know that we would be the leader on this. I think there are some pretty high standards that are out there already. Okay, the last question over here. We need to keep it to one minute. Question and answer included. Hey, I'm Brian Waltz. I'm with um, DataKind and also the Life Flight Foundation. And I'm hearing you all talk, first of all, awesome pair, so thank you. Um, I'm hearing you all talk about using the AI to drive profits. Uh, in your company, you seem to see the AI to drive social Yeah, I mean, I think for us, we'll start with. It's really good when your core product or service has a very positive social impact. So when you can serve more people and you can get to them more quickly and you can get to them more efficiently, so you're taking less out of their paycheck to pay for their benefits, that's a huge win. Um, I do think, and I know this isn't exactly the thrust of your question, but I think it's really important too to think about the average job. And some of the reference in the Kinsey report about automating away the workforce. And my, I have a different take, which is just about everybody's job, mine included, panel included, has a, a, some portion of the work that is just money. And it's mind numbing and it's soul crushing. <laughs> 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 yeah, right? <laughs> <laughs> and this is what people want to do. This is what get people fired up. It wasn't. It isn't what fills their bucket. So I do think that there's a huge opportunity to elevate the work that people do, and in doing so, I, I'm not a big one on what has huge social value to it. So that that would be another. I think, yeah. Okay. So as we come to an end, and before I wrap up and thank our panelists, uh, you met two of the three musketeers. I'm going to hand it over to the third musket, you the first, I don't know. Chris, I wanted to say one word. 30 seconds. Hi, um, everyone. I'm Chris Mallet. Uh, Margaret mentioned uh, our third anniversary of the Roots Day. And all of the leaders and the organizations before you here, including others who are in the audience, our colleagues from JAX, the Maine Health, the Hydex, the Protocol Study, and PTC, were with us three years ago across the way. Uh, and we're among the first people, um, frankly, to make commitments and investments in Northeastern's efforts mm -hmm. in various ways, by giving us your business and your opportunity, by supporting your learners, by opening your doors to us, most of when we were homeless, and saying that <laughs> afternoon, we may be able to help you with this campus thing you need. Um, and three years later, you know, you're know, you leading among this community. And, and we celebrated a little bit this morning with our team, and we rewatched Dave Drew's remarks. 
She talked about, uh, you know, what a long game we're playing here. And I just want to thank all of you on behalf of everyone in the Eastern and everyone in this room and all and those other partners that I just mentioned for believing in this opportunity and being with us then and being with us again today. So thank you to you and, and all of your teams for your leadership in this community. Thank you. So please, please join me in thanking our panelists. They took their valuable time, showed up here, answered some very tough questions, shows you the level of engagement and commitment. I love it. Uh, made me very happy today. <laughs> um, so please, please join me in thanking our panelists. And A discussion titled, Looking Ahead, Maine's AI Talent Pipeline. This will be moderated by Dr. Michael Bennett, Director of Education Curriculum, Business Lead for Responsible AI for the Institute for Experiential AI. Dr. Bennett's legal practice and research primarily concerns innovation in the arts and techno-scientific fields. Dr. Bennett was an Associate Research Professor at Arizona State University as well as an Associate Professor of Law at Northeastern University. He has served as a member of the American Bar Association's Committee on Bioethics and the Law. Currently, he serves as a board member of the Leonardo ISAST, the planet's leading arts, technology, and science nonprofit. Please welcome Dr. Michael Bennett and our panelists. Thanks so much, uh, Nick Loesch, um, uh, dear colleague and friend, and thanks to Team Roo for pulling all of this together. And uh, greetings to, uh, to all of you that have yet to meet out here. What a lovely crowd. High energy. I was really curious on our panel as well. It's a fine honor of mine today to be uh, here with this, uh, this great uh, luminary uh, set of figures on the panel. Um, in order, from uh, my right, going across, we have uh, Madeline Maurer, who is the Chief of Presidential Initiatives at the uh, Jackson Laboratory. Giovanna Udaboni, who is Dean of Engineering at the University of Maine. Uh, Jason Judd, Executive Director of Educate Maine. Our own uh, Dan Kowalski, who is the Head of Learning Programs and Professor of Practice here at the room. And then rounding us out at the far end of the lineup is uh, Leia Arsenault, who's a data analyst at IBAI. So again, uh, just a little round of applause for them. So we'll try to, uh, we'll see how this works. We'll try to limit our responses to uh, about three minutes per panelist, you know, because they think we're answering the questions that I lay out for them. And if we do that, I think we'll be able to reserve a bit of time for the end, um, and then during which we will invite you in the audience to, uh, to send us some, some questions, or send them some questions, time permitting. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh, Matt, one of the first ones for you. Uh, you see, you oversee a, a really impressive organization that's, uh, that's focused on using AI in various ways to define its future and to shape its future. Um, how does talent sourcing and development fit into your planning for those possible <laughs> desirable futures? Great. Thank you, Michael. Um, so, at Jackson Laboratory, our big ambitious goal is to realize the power of genetics to transform human health. And here is where we're at. Data generation is no longer the bottleneck. We have more than 30 million people worldwide whose genome has been sequenced. We know of hundreds of thousands of variants in disease in, in the DNA that are associated with various types of disease. And um, we have at Jackson Laboratory, we have petabytes of mouse data that we use in order to better um, understand human condition and physiology. They are great models for being able to then speed um, the uh, 
transition of possible uh, research findings into the clinic and improve success and improve impact. But where we are right now and we're at the forefront is that our new bottleneck is on data analysis. And so we need to integrate this data, not just bit by bit, but we need to do it at scale. And that's bringing mouse data sets together with human data sets. It's bringing those data sets to the compute and to the um, artificial intelligence and machine learning algorithms. And with that, we're expecting that we're gonna find unexpected patterns, we can find new insights, and that gives us possibilities for new interventions, for new cures. Now, that means that biology is really becoming a computational field. And to do that, in order to advance and realize our goals, we have to double down on our investment in data sciences. We need people here in Maine in order to be able to do that. And the types of skills that we need are going to be folks who have experience with statistics, mathematics, uh, programming and coding, bioinformatics. Um, we will be hiring scientific software engineers, curators, data engineers, analysts, and product managers to help with bringing that forward. Um, you know, today when we do our work, we often have a pairing of a biologist who is determining what are the big questions in a disease area, devising a hypothesis, and then doing the wet lab experiments and bringing that data to a computer scientist who is then processing the data, developing the algorithms, and bringing the data back for the biologist to then decide whether or not the results are meaningful. I mean, it, it can't be random, it has to be something that's really going to start to answer the questions. And that works great when that team sticks together and really is um, working well. When they start to drift apart, we see a noticeable reduction in the quality of the research. So one of our challenges is to be able to skill our employees and our new hires to be able to operate on both sides of those two um, disciplinary fields to be able to do computation as well as biology. And we really need multifunctional teams, those who are actually going to be able to work together, not just from a technical standpoint, but also with communication. We need folks who can interact with each other and who are lifelong learners. They're really interested in continually uh, adapting to the new emerging technologies. And so, you know, at Jackson Laboratory, we're handling some of that by doing some upskilling of our employees. We are devising our own educational programs uh, in programming, bioinformatics. We've actually worked with the Rue Institute and Dan Glosky to develop a custom machine learning class for um, technical individuals in our computational sciences and IT department. And um, we use Jack's data sets and Jack's high performance computing environments in order to do that. Uh, to do that course. Um, we've uh, hired 20 co-ops from the Rue Institute, and we have also brought in seniors from Colby College to uh, come and do their senior master's, uh, or seniors uh, programs or, or projects with us. And um, those individuals have systems genetics and coding experience, which is exactly what we need. But the reality is that it's not enough. We need a much bigger talent pipeline and we need a diverse talent pipeline in order to be able to realize our vision and make a true game-changing impact on human health. Awesome. Thank you, Madeline. Don't drop the mic yet. Uh, Giovanna, uh, welcome. Uh, you are in a singular position on, on the panel here. You're a dean, uh, an engineering uh, dean, an engineering school dean. Um, and I think that means that you are, as a, as a result, uh, in other words, therefore, perfectly positioned, right, to talk to us about the factors that play into whether a learner succeeds or, or not. And so what qualities would you say are necessary for success as a practitioner the contemporary data ecosystems. Okay. It's difficult to go after Madeline. <laughs> so, and you see, um, I cheated a little bit. I asked the same question to the previous panel. <laughs> and so I, I, I build on their answer. Uh, one was uh, critical thinking. And in order for that to happen, it is very important that we provide 
you know, education that is of high quality, that our graduates have solid uh, technical skills, uh, which means that they know, they are aware of the limitations that the methods have, the range of applicability, so that our graduates do not misuse uh, techniques or, or methods. So there is no magic wand in any possible AI or software or whatever. Every piece of technology has advantages, disadvantages, and they are optimal and we can trust the results when they are used as they are supposed to be used, when the assumptions behind are met. So critical thinking is important. But all the other uh, answers were about communication, collaboration, business awareness. And uh, actually, this is what I wanted to bring up in my answer with two examples uh, specific to my experience. So the first one is about my research lab. So we actually work on, and also my activity as a consultant, about uh, um, designing sensors for non-invasive monitoring of cardiovascular and pulmonary function, especially for elderly individuals, so that you can put these sensors you know, in the mattress or in the armchair and not bother. I, and that when I was uh, beginning this project, which I did not begin, I just jumped in, I was thinking of my grandma, which is pretty, who is pretty grumpy. And you know, if you don't, don't mess with her if you don't need to, you know? And so it is kind of, <laughs> Okay, so first of all, the critical thinking and the solid technical skills need to go in making sure that the signals that come out from the sensors and how they are <coughs> an analyzed raise a warning, for example, or an alert, if there is indeed something that needs to be you know, overseen. Like it is not just because she turns on the bed or because, but there is, so that is where the science is. But then how do you communicate that there is a problem to my grandma? or to the nursing staff, or to, so how do you communicate that? And so we really need to partner across disciplines so that, for example, our data scientists are able to explain what certain things or changes in the signals or the change in the projection of the feature space, whatever, means for, for example, cardiovascular health or that particular monitoring. And the second thing is, uh, I studied engineering and then mathematics, and then I was kind of very now understood as old school modeling based on the principle of physics and differential equations. And so for family reasons, we moved from Strasbourg to Missouri, and the only money were in data science. And so I became a data scientist. Uh, and uh, it seems opportunistic, but how many people in the workforce may, found them, may find themselves in a position that they have to reinvent themselves or pivot their technical skills without trashing them? And so, for example, I, you know, I then, anyway, sold myself in a way that I believed in because otherwise I wouldn't be here, which is that old school modeling can help and in combination with AI to give methods that are also interpretable in terms of the mechanisms so that the answers are actionable upon. And so I think now I conclude to say that in higher education, I, I think we have a, a high responsibility uh, also to, to train people in this open-minded way and to you know, break down some of the silos that we have built artificially across disciplines so that our students that we want to train in an open-minded way, don't see faculty closed in their offices, you know. They, we need to be the role models for them too. And Jason, I'm well primed to, uh, to talk to you. Just within the last uh, 10 days or so, we've spent a couple of hours with a bunch of third grade that's talking about the intersection between art and geometry in the middle and we didn't spend a lot of time at least thinking about what's pretty big those primary age uh, students and so I wonder if we can build a bit on what we just heard from Madeline and Giovanna um, what they were saying about the qualities uh, that, that come into play if we're talking about not only uh, introducing these, uh, these complex topics but doing everything we can as educators either formally or informally to ensure the progress and the, the maturation of the, the learners. And so, you know, what, um, what can you say to us? Uh, what, what types of thoughts can you share with us about what needs to happen upstream in primary education systems, K through 12, to satisfy the workforce requirements in the mid-range future, say, a decade out from now? 
Thanks for the question. Hopefully I can answer it in the next three minutes or so. Um, it's been great to hear the themes that have been talked about already today. And so many of those themes relate to the work we do in our K-12 education system here in our state. You know, when we talk about critical thinking, we talk about problem solving, we talk about strong communication skills, those are part of our guiding principles in our K-12 education here in our state. And those are so many of the principles that our teachers work on constantly with me and youth across the state. Um, so much, you know, we have wonderful teachers across the state working so hard to make sure our young people have the skills to be successful, whether it be in post-secondary ed or directly into the workforce, but they really need your help. Uh, the, this industry is evolving, as we, as we heard, uh, every day, every month, every year, and we need to have our industry community and our higher ed community partner with our K-12 community so that we can really help uh, make sure that our learners have the skills that they need to transition into uh, connected industries like this, to know what tech pathways are in the state of Maine, to know how to use uh, big data in, in their um, career pathways and know the great work that's happening in our state. Uh, right now, only uh, about 60% of high schools in Maine offer a computer science class, which is typically where you might be introduced to some of the more specific concepts that relate to artificial intelligence. And they, some of those only offer one course as an elective course. And that's compared to other states across um, the country that are actually requiring all of their students to have foundational computer science skills and skills in very cutting edge science and engineering, uh, as well as in math. So we really need to continue to um, bring the education and the industry community together. Um, the educators are, are, are um, very excited about working uh, hand in hand with the business community on these topics because their students are talking about them. They're engaging with them throughout this, the school day in different ways and educators are, are sometimes trying to catch up with, with these particular trends. So I want to give a couple of quick bright spots because we're doing some great work in this area. Educate Me and the nonprofit where I work is one of a couple of nonprofits and higher end institutions that are working really closely uh, with the education community and the business community to bring them together uh, to be able to have high quality STEM instruction in our state. So for example, as we look across the landscape here in Portland, Lyman Moore Middle School, which is just a few uh, miles from here, has a couple of middle school teachers that are teaching computer science classes to all of the middle school students, making sure that any student going through Lyman Moore has foundational computer science classes and understands the career pathways in there and the connection to science and math and other subjects so that they can pursue these pathways right here in Portland. That same thing is happening in rural communities all across the state, either with uh, computer science courses or an integrated courses with science and math and other topics. And my role at Educate Maine and my colleagues here at Maine Math Science Alliance at RU at the University of Maine are helping to bring those teachers and industry together so that they can learn how to teach computer science courses and related sort of data science courses here in our state. But there's great work happening and it's happening all across and it's really happening at the intersection of K-12, higher ed, and business. And I would just really encourage you, if you're not connected with your K-12 schools locally, to reach out to say, how can we help you? How can we work on these community challenges that are data-centric? How can your students help solve some of these challenges? Uh, I'm just proud that there's great work happening, but we have a lot more work to do. And we need to do that through supporting our educators, supporting our local school systems, providing them the resources and the support to be able to do their jobs well. And I think we can get there and have this uh, pipeline coming up into the University of Maine and here at RU and then into employment that we're all striving to have. Let's uh, time travel uh, back uh, closer to, to this moment, right? Let's think a little bit about um, what needs to happen uh, today and in the very near future, say one to two years out, to increase and enrich available talent. Sure. Um, if we think about what's going on right now, we have this very exciting technical discontinuity in, in the data economy and the AI economy, and that's really, really interesting and exciting to be a part of. We had another one of those in ancient history 30 years ago with the rise of this newfangled thing called the internet. And when the internet happened, at the beginning, a small number of practitioners did a lot of work, and that was really exciting, but it didn't start to change business, and it didn't start to change all of our lives until far more people in organizations and society got involved in the internet. 
Not just when the webmaster decided, hey, we can do something really cool on the internet, but when the sales manager at a company decided we could use the internet. And so when we think about the types of talent that we can bring to bear to do something in the AI economy, we need a whole spectrum of practitioners um, all over organizations to be able to work with this set of new technology. That includes tip of the spear practitioners, data scientists, and artificial intelligence engineers, and data engineers, that's really important. We need a lot of those folks, we don't have enough. We also though need data literate sales managers, marketing managers, supply chain managers, executives, people who understand how to work in this economy, and we need them now. Because the decisions that we all make as businesses are um, going to have very meaningful downstream implications um, on society in our use of artificial intelligence. So what that means is that we need a variety of programs in the higher education space to enable a much bigger tent of, of folks directly participating in the different aspects of this economy. That includes things like degrees and when people take time away from their career, come to school and, and do deep study. But it also really includes um, uh, non-degree work. Working with learning in the in the um, in the scope of work, uh, you heard all of our panelists earlier talk about how we're working with them to try to upskill their workforces today. Um, we want to build the workforce of tomorrow in K through 12, but we also need to help people today um, interact, and that's really learning in the flow of work. So whether we think about innovations in the degree space, where we service a wide variety of practitioner types um, across that spectrum, or um, degree and non-degree opportunities for higher education to be involved, we think that's where we can really help build a much broader base of talent to really actually unlock the value just like happened in the second 10 years of the internet. There's, um, as I'm sure you know, there's a, a minor theme here running that's implicit in the experience of at least two people on the panel. This, um, this notion of uh, self-transformation, right, or discipline, disciplinary shifting or transformation, one might say. In that way, you and uh, and Giovanna are, uh, are kin because you recently made a shift, a career shift, um, and pivoted into the data industry. Could you talk to us a bit about uh, about your journey? Because I'm sure there, you know, there may be even a few people in this room considering a uh, shift. Um, but in this chaotic world, um, you know, you could um, forgive someone for feeling a bit skittish about the possibility right, and what it might actually entail. So it'd be great if we could hear a bit uh, from you about about that journey. Sure. Um, so I was a wedding photographer for about seven years, self-employed in Portland. I probably shot your offspring or friend's wedding <laughs> all around New England. Um, and I knew I wanted to do a career change. I was just looking for what that could be. And when the Ruins 2 opened, um, I said, that's it. That's the specific thing that I can do. Um, it felt like a kind of program you could do where you there was a job at the other side of it. I knew what job to search for at the end of this program. Um, so I came to the RU initially for project management and spoke with Dan and was like, can I do analytics? Like, that sounds more fun. <laughs> um, and he said, you know, why not? Um, so I think what was the most important like throughout the transition was just learning that as long as you want to learn you can do it um, like we learned all sorts of you know we covered all the topics um, and you could deep dive into what you wanted to do um, and through the experiential learning program we got to work with real companies um, in the area and hear what their problems were and then take that back as a class and figure out how to help them with their problems. And that's essentially what my job is now. So I work at a agency um, that's based in Los Angeles. They specialize in NLP. And on a daily basis, I'm just talking to stakeholders who have questions. They don't necessarily know what the answer is or how they're going to get it, but 
we collect the data, we find insights that hopefully help them make better decisions. And that was like the whole theme of the program was just ask questions, you know, figure it out. And that's my most like that's my most valuable advice I try to give someone if they want to switch a career into this. Like it seems really foreign, but I'm really glad this critical thinking <laughs> thread has come up because as long as you think of yourself as that and can you know just believe that you can critical think and figure it out, that's um, you know that's what this field is good for. One more question for you, uh, Madeline, and then if we've been disciplined enough, we'll open it up for one or two questions from, from the audience. So uh, nationwide, there's a, a ton of virtual ink being spent on uh, thought pieces about the future of work and then the, the state of labor broadly understood, both domestically and internationally. And there are even more meditations um, in public discourse around the future of AI. Uh, all of it uh, super exciting, I think, for many of us, but for, for you specifically, uh, what's exciting about the future of talent development here in Maine right now? Thanks, Michael. I, I am so excited when I hear the presentations we've heard this morning and what my panelists here are saying as well, too. I think we are really poised to elevate the biosciences um, sector and tech se sector here in Maine. And you know, we, let's do it together. We do it with intentionality. We do it by creating a, a regional engine and a hub, one that's not necessarily just about partnership one-to-one, -one, but actually really truly having a collaborative network. If we do that, we could really change the AI you know, nature here in Maine, and we could actually elevate the brand of Maine. So imagine that Maine becomes known for its AI, the way we think of the Research Triangle Park in North Carolina, or we think about biotech emerging from Boston. Um, it could change the complete nature of our workforce, and it would absolutely be a boost to our economy here in Maine, and for the people of Maine, and for the generations to come. So it looks like our, um, our taskmaster is saying that we have time for for one, one, two, twelve questions. Um, so super interesting um, panel here. So I'm sure you've got a few that are teed up already. Were you raising your hand? Hi, thank you all for being here. Um, this is maybe a non-specific question, but I'm sorry, I forgot the gentleman's name in the center. Jason. Jason, um, particularly for you, I, um, uh, I've worked in tech for a, a while now, uh, mostly out of state, large tech firms, but I'm bringing it home. But I also have a high school student and a middle school student, and I find uh, the, the lack of education, but also awareness about the jobs that we have here at that age group is you know, kids are going to go away and study outside of Maine, but we want them to know what's here when they come back and hope perhaps that they come back. But even the guidance counselors specifically, I feel like if you could target them, because I also coach young women in tech, and guidance counselors don't know what's available. So no, no offense to the guidance counselors, it's great, but something is missing for this young people. So it's more of a statement. Yeah, no, I, I certainly agree. I'm a former school counselor. Uh, and so, <laughs> um, but I will admit one that did not know a lot about tech pathways, right? Because that was not sort of the pathway that I chose uh, sort of through the humanities in terms of uh, my undergraduate and graduate education. Uh, so I do think it's all about partnership. We need to bring our business community, our higher community, and our K-12 schools and the staff at each of those together to learn about the industries here in Maine, the robust opportunities we're losing too many young people um, outside of our state because our young people don't believe there are opportunities here for them for high paying wages, great social opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. And we just need to change that narrative and we need to continue to be more inclusive from folks who choose to, to, to move here as well. So I think it's all about you know, uh, locally how you might be able from the business sense get involved with your local schools to have conversations with those guidance counselors, with those educators. Is there an opportunity to come in and do, uh, you know, uh, 
a week of uh, computer science education in December and do some coding. Is there a way to partner with a teacher to bring in some different uh, folks from different tech occupations to talk more to the young people? It doesn't have to be big and complicated. It can be very small uh, to be able to change um, you know, the, the education that's happening in, in K-12, especially around career pathways. We have Hi. one right here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Bobby Lamont. I am an, an angel investor with the Maine Angels Group, but I'm previously a high school chemistry teacher. And I had a wonderful conversation with one of my science heroes, Dr. Bob Langer from Langer Labs at MIT. And I asked him at that time what his wish list was for science education. And his answer was teaching error analysis from the beginning. So I just wanted to, one, put that be in everyone's bonnet, and two, hear any thoughts about um, science and math education related to data, but data is only as good as our, as our probability of it being accurate. So that, that, that coupling of error analysis with data. So um, at the higher education space, uh, the conversations around data quality um, in, in our uh, class environments are, are ever present and omnipresent. And that's why we, whenever our students will come uh, work um, in our classrooms, they're gonna be using real data, messy data, um, problematic data from day one. But I think your question is more about how we do that earlier. And um, what I would say is uh, uh, something at the root that's been going on is we're working with the Northeastern's Corey College of Computer Science on our graduate certificate in inclusive computer education. And part of that uh, effort is to figure out how we adapt those critical thinking and, um, uh, and similar skills-based exercises for variety of student types farther earlier. You can have conversations uh, like that um, in kindergarten depending on uh, if you set up the um, environment where those conversations naturally happen in a language that a kindergartner can understand um, about tasks that the kindergartner considers relevant to them. So we're working a lot with um, folks in the education space and our partners at Educate Maine to figure out how we take those very important conversations and bring them to students um, in a way that is relevant and appropriate for their age level um, earlier in K-12. There's a huge amount of opportunity there. We totally agree with you. Um, and it can't be just happening um, at, the, uh, at the higher education level. So I totally agree to the point that also I, I developed some, a mathematical modeling course for STEM educators uh, to uh, help them envision some projects or some examples that they could use in the classroom. One, so one thing, I may be provocative, I don't know, but when, like from the beginning, in the very first classes of math from, I don't know, K and on, it is like, did you get the right answer? There is order a right answer. You are, so you're saying, I mean, either you're right or wrong, you know, but if you're right, you're right. That almost never happens. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, putting that sense of blurriness. So yes, there, are, there is rigor in the operations that we define, but the numbers, uh, it depends where they're, where they're coming from. So let us question the numbers also. Uh, and I think that can happen from very early. Uh, but without, so I would say it is important to maintain, so there is rigor and there is exactness in certain things, like the operation of addition. The oper so these things, you can make sure that you are doing them right. Uh, but again, putting that seed that we should not trust the numbers uh, always regardless. And this can be done from very early. So, so sorry, I, I know there's some other hands out here, but uh, Mr. Tan is saying that that's a wrap for us. <laughs> so let's thank the panel. For <laughs>
The first is uh, Professor Dale Tosevsky. He's an associate professor of physics and astronomy at Colby College, and he's been a faculty member there since 2014. He earned his doctorate in astrophysics from the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and completed his undergraduate studies at the University of Michigan. He, can, he, he conducted his postdoctoral research at the University of California, Davis in Santa Cruz. His research focuses on the study of black holes and their effect on the growth and evolution of galaxies. Our second lightning speaker, I'm just going to introduce you both because you're just going to attack team. Um, Mohammed Wasabi is the Associate Dean for, Academic, uh, for Academics and Research in the College of Engineering at the University of Maine, and he's a professor in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Having previously served as Chair and Associate Dean of the College of Engineering, has over 38 years of experience in engineering education and research in areas including smart grid, power systems, intelligent systems, neural networks, and robotics. He's collaborated with over 40 national companies and organizations in research and development. So, Professor Kosevsky. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work we've been doing uh, applying machine learning and AI to uh, images taken from uh, the NASA's Hubble Space Telescope and more recently the newly launched James Webb Space Telescope. And the goal of this work is to identify interacting and merging galaxies in uh, these imaging data sets. And so, maybe we can move to the next slide. Here. So one of the most spectacular events that we actually see in astronomical images is the collision of two galaxies. And that's what's shown in this simulation here. This is the collision of two Milky Way uh, type galaxies. There's about 200 billion stars in each one of these galaxies. And uh, as they collide, all sorts of interesting things start to happen. There's a burst of star formation that generates these blue stars that you see here. And the gravitational torques that uh, result uh, because of this interaction start to scramble the orbits of stars in these galaxies. And so they go from these ordered disk-like structures into a system that looks chaotic with uh, stars orbiting in all kinds of random directions. And so the final result here is now a galaxy that has been changed, its morphology, structure has changed, and it looks like a spheroidal system as opposed to that ordered disk-like structure that we saw before. <laughs> Uh, in fact, uh, the Andromeda galaxy, the nearest galaxy to us, is actually on a collision course with the Milky Way. And, uh, and so in the, precisely, or roughly about 4.5 billion years, uh, this, is that, this process will, uh, will play out when the Milky Way in, actually interacts with Andromeda. That's actually what this simulation uh, was, uh, was intended to show, the collision of the Milky Way with the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, so mergers are actually key to a variety of different processes in, uh, in the universe. We think that mergers, uh, galaxy mergers like this are key to the hierarchical assembly of structure in the universe, meaning that we think that all things in the universe started out small and they slowly grow over time via these types of collisions and interactions. Uh, we think that uh, it is, it is uh, these types of interactions that result in the, in the, the change in the morphology of galaxies over time. Um, and so when you smash together two disk-like galaxies, you get a spheroid at the end. And so we think over time, as the universe ages, the structure of galaxies changes uh, uh, slowly. And uh, of particular interest to me, we think that um, galaxies, when galaxies interact, uh, some of the gas of those galaxies gets funneled to the center of the galaxy and uh, fuels growth of a supermassive black hole that we think sits at the center of every galaxy. Uh, and we, this is really the only process that we know, that we understand, that could possibly fuel the growth of supermassive black holes. But it is, of course, only a theory. We don't actually know whether th these type of interactions are really powering uh, the black holes at the center of galaxies. And so uh, one of the things that we want to do is identify galaxies that are interacting, study their properties, and try to determine whether they, in fact, have, are driving these mechanisms that we see, that we think that they're doing. But the key to doing this, of course, is first identifying interacting galaxies. Uh, and this turns out to be a somewhat difficult process because uh, interacting galaxies don't have a specific shape to look for. It is a process, a continuous process, and so you end up getting a variety of shapes, and it's a, it's a fairly chaotic process. I liken it to looking for a train in an image. If you know what an Im a train looks like, you can train something to look for that train. But in fact, what we're looking for is a train wreck or, or the collision of two trains. 
Uh, and so that process can have a variety of different shapes. And so it actually becomes a slightly more uh, uh, complex problem than simply looking for something that has a known shape or design. This is a, a mosaic of nearby interacting galaxies uh, imaged with the Hubble Space Telescope. You can see this wide array of morphologies that they have. Uh, so the main way that we do, we do this, uh, the main way that we identify interacting galaxies and images is we basically just use uh, human visual classification. So our eyes are fantastic pattern recognizers. And so we'll sit a student down in front of a simulation like the one I showed you guys earlier and uh, have them watch that and then show them a bunch of images and say, which one of these images looks like that interacting galaxy? And hopefully, uh, you guys can see that maybe these galaxies over on the, it's not showing, uh, the galaxies over on the right look a little bit more disturbed and asymmetric than the galaxies on, on the left. And, and so uh, we can basically just use that, the general appearance, uh, to search for uh, these interacting galaxies. Now, this can be highly accurate. Uh, the, uh, this can have a high accuracy if you do this with, with uh, trained astronomers, but it is time consuming and obviously does not scale very easily because you have, you have to have human eyeballs looking at these, these images. Um, you can get around this uh, by crowdsourcing this, and so we've uh, done this by putting up our images onto uh, um, uh, the Galaxy Zoo website where we have uh, citizen scientists go in and classify images, but again, uh, you, this is not going to be able to scale to the, the, uh, the size of data sets that, that are going to be coming down the pipeline. And so, just want to talk a little bit about the problem of scale. This is an image taken with uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, I take it about six months ago. And in this image, there are several thousand galaxies that you might want to classify and try to identify if there's merges. Every little speck. Uh, in this uh, in this image, except for these guys that have uh, the diffraction spikes, uh, are basically galaxies. There's only three stars, or four or five stars in this image. The rest of all these things are galaxies. Um, and and so you've got several thousand galaxies that you want to classify in this image, but this is actually an exceedingly small portion of the sky. In fact, uh, this fraction uh, of this image would actually just get, make up a very small fraction of the size of the moon on the sky. And we have detectors now that can image several hundred times the size of the moon around the sky in a single image. And so this is actually uh, the, the field of view of a 3.2 gigapixel detector that's going to be installed in a uh, federally funded telescope down in Chile uh, later this year. Uh, and so you can essentially take an image like this and uh, take, get an image of several hundred thousand galaxies in a single snapshot. And of course, you can then start mosaicing this and, uh, and expanding this uh, over to the sky. And in fact, over the next 10 years, uh, uh, telescopes with even larger detectors are coming online uh, to the point where we think we're going to be able to image uh, the entire night sky in every, in, in, uh, every uh, three to four days. And in doing so, we'll be producing a lot of data, about 20 terabytes of data per day will be coming down. But more importantly, we're going to be imaging 7 trillion objects every time we do this. So every three to four days, you're going to image 7 trillion objects. No matter how many devoted citizen scientists you get, we're not going to be able to look at them. <laughs> uh, and so we really need uh, machine learning and AI to, to tackle this. And so uh, the two of the, uh, uh, the algorithms that we use to, to search for interacting galaxies are uh, random force classification and, and uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, for a random force analysis, we essentially uh, run our algorithms on quantitative measurements that we make on the images themselves. We're not running it on the images themselves, but we can make measurements of, on the images, such as how asymmetric is the light distribution of the galaxy? Uh, how concentrated is that light? Uh, we can measure things like the Gini coefficient. It tells us how distributed, evenly distributed, the, the light distribution of the galaxy is. And so even though an interacting galaxy doesn't have a specific shape, we can say that uh, the galaxies on uh, the upper panel there look a little bit more asymmetric than the galaxies on the bottom panel. The bottom panel galaxies might be more concentrated. And so we can use distinct me differences in these measurements and then train a random force classifier to look at these different uh, quantitative measurements to try to identify these mergers. Uh, and we do this all, we train uh, these algorithms on human classifications. So we've got uh, so on the order of 10,000 human uh, classified uh, uh, morphologies, and we can basically use that as our training set. And uh, the, but since we're dealing with imaging data sets, uh, the convolutional neural networks are another great tool to use for this. And so here we actually use, we apply the CNS directly to the images, 
Uh, and we basically look, we can train them to look for specific features in uh, images like tidal arms, uh, where, gal where stars get stripped out of a galaxy and get flung out, uh, asymmetric morphologies and things like this. And again, we can train this on uh, human classifications. And it turns out both of these methods uh, produce, uh, are pretty good at reproducing what humans see in these images. In fact, the random forest classifier gives us something like uh, an accuracy and precision of around 93%. Uh, we get a little bit less uh, the, the CNNs perform a little bit, um, uh, a little bit poorer than the, the random forest classifiers, but we think that actually might be more due to the limitations of the human classification. The CNNs are actually picking up something that the humans are not picking up, and that is because obviously humans, the human classified galaxies are not true. Uh, they are basically what we think might be happening, uh, and so, so instead we can, we can instead run our classifiers on, not on, uh, we, sorry, we can train our classifiers not on uh, human classified um, um, uh, morphologies, but instead on the simulations themselves. And this is something that we're doing right now. We can basically collide two galaxies together and put cameras all over the place so we can get essentially data sets of what the ground truth actually is. And so we don't actually need humans to classify these images beforehand. We can simply take the results of our simulations and train our CNS to look for features that come out of our simulations. In this movie, here I'm comparing uh, simulated a simulated merger to real galaxies that Hubble has actually seen. And you can see that essentially if you just move your camera around, you start finding examples of different stages of these interactions in nearby galaxies. And so this is something that we're working on that I'll be working on next year is essentially training uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to look for features in our simulated data sets. And so uh, you could, I'm just gonna, yeah, you can throw up the summary slide there. So, uh, so I'll throw up my summary slide and uh, take any questions. discovered um, planet, would it be the equivalent of the algorithm that facial recognition uses to be able to uh, attribute that this was already identified and winnow out of all the others that aren't yet discovered? Um, the, the, the CNN uh, doing the image classification, it very much does work in the same way that the, the facial recognition uh, software does. In, in these cases, um, we would be applying to new data sets where, where essentially we, no one has looked at, at the objects before. So we kind of know going in that no one's found these things. Yeah, first. Great. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Um, and the uh, Blue Institute for giving me the opportunity to um, present uh, our work to the audience here. Um, I wanted to, we heard a lot about AI today, and I just want to open that black box for you to say it's nothing important and you can do it. No, honestly, I'm not telling you. Um, you can do it. And when you're driving back home, think of where you have data and then get to using it because that's to your advantage. And I wanted to also put my um, presentation in perspective by showing you the lab about um, in the late 80s, early 90s, when we started teaching and doing research at the University of Maine, this is the Intelligent System Lab. So what are we trying to achieve with AI? Of course, human intelligence get information from five sensory, that's where we gather data, and then we recognize, we group. Um, I'm able to group animals from jet engines, from cars, approximate, interpolate, predict, memorize, recall. These are what human beings are doing and we are capable of doing. And the whole idea behind AI, and more specifically machine learning, is to do the same thing um, in artificial intelligence. 
um, public. And so these are the same thing. The only difference is that the processes that are happening in our brain is unknown. We are still with all advances that we have done, we don't know what this process is. We don't know how our brain processes this information to get the intelligence that we have while in the AI we know what that process is. is. In fact, our processes is nothing but an extension of our mathematical and computational modeling with a tiny, tiny little bit of connection to our biological neural systems. So opening up the black box of AI, um, we break it down. I told you it's a function. It's a mathematical function. It's not a closed loop function. It's not like y is equal to sine of x. But for now, assume that I can break this box into several different functions. That's my input and that's my output. As I go from the input to my knowledge here, I increase the complexity of my knowledge and I reduce um, the complexity in the data through this function. So our AI knowledge is a function of function of function of function of this. How do I implement that function? This is one way of doing it. I said one way because there are many different ways of doing it. Through putting a bunch of nodes or biological neuron likes in distributed and parallel processing. That is the importance of that. Remember that. We don't have a closed loop function, but we have a bunch of simple nodes that are acting in um, parallel and distributed manner to give the knowledge that we have. So what is the connection to <coughs> biological systems? This is a neural system. This is nothing new. This is almost from 80 years ago, this model. Um, this is our, the nucleus of a cell in human brain gets information from a stimulus, external and internal. And when it performs some kind of function on this, we call it activation function. And when that activation fun function gets to a threshold level, that cell starts to excite. When it excites, it starts sending signals to other cells and say, you start activating. Imagine you're sitting in a, in a very dark room. You are not able to see anything because your visual senses are not working, are not stimulated. As soon as the tail lights on, you see something, you start to recognize someone here, and as it gets um, lighter, you see more and more. When it gets too much, you don't recognize anything. Exactly when the sun is shining at your eyes. That's exactly what that function is doing. Goes from one level to another level in between. It's either linear or a nonlinear function. And that is exactly what a neuron that I showed in the previous slide is doing. It's trying to mimic. Again, this model is not new and it is from 80 years ago. Why did it become so important these days? And I should say in the 80s when we started the work because the learning process was created at that time. And so if you want to look at a neural network, and I know you have um, chat GPT, which is mostly conversational. Um, our work was mostly industrial, not conversational or NLP. Um, but you basically start by designing this, a network like this. It's done for you, you don't need to worry about it. There are many software, it's created. Google has lots of routines that can give you this. And then you start training by data, you heard a whole lot about data. And then of course, once you're training by data, you verify as engineers, um, we have to uh, verify what we have done and start our final Next, please. So I'm going to go through some of the projects that we have done. And you ask me how engineer got into biology. That is the beauty of neural network. 
you need to have expertise at the data level, not at the cell level. So this was a project that was supported by NSF and also Jackson Lab. At that time, they were cutting and pasting. We sent it to a neural network. We karyotyped it. We basically recognized, classified the information and put it together. Next, please. This is a DNA sequencing. We started with a single molecule, gel image. We sent it to a neural network, and this is what we got. Next, please. DNA basis. All the changes that you see in DNA sequencing is done through some of these techniques and others. Um, but you also we were also able to give confidence level at our decision. Next, please. What can you see in here? Nothing. <laughs> yeah, and that's the case. This is called digital train elevation data supported by DOD 30 years ago. And we gave it to a neural network. One level of operation, features are starting to show themselves. More knowledge gathered. Next, please. This is what we got. Lakes, watershed areas. When it's rain and when it's, when it's flooding, where are we going to see flooding? Show the aerial image, please. And that is the aerial image. Good job, huh? <laughs> well, this is the power of AI that you've been hearing today. And my purpose of this presentation, I can talk to you for 10 hours, was to tell you, as I said in the beginning, that when you go back home, see what data you have and how you can apply it. Next, please. This is the Parkland paper processes. We work with many companies in Maine and also outside of Maine. The carpet that you are flo that is on the floor, the ceiling, is made by other strong work industry. A continuous process, 24-7. They're starting from raw material, which is very valuable. Could come from Russia, could come from Asia, but it's working in S.T. Warren Company or Champion International to give you the paper that you want. This is a continuous process. The paper that comes out of the quality of that depends a minute or so before based on the raw material that we have and is going through this process. If we have because of the variability over there, you're going to have a valuable paper, and therefore, you have 200 ingredients we add in here. This is like a making the soup, and therefore, we have to be able to predict how this quality is, and based on the quality here, as just here. <laughs> so that's a control issue, and we have done it by neural network. Let's <laughs> please. And these are. The, the blue is the uh, actual data, the red is the prediction that we have done. Notice that I have removed the actual data, so there is no uh, security issues here. Next. Where are we going? This is, application is exploding these days because of what all this software that you see. And the purpose of Google Institute is also to do this. The, the, the gathering that you see is to encourage you to apply it into more application. At the same time, I would like to see more connection between what we're doing and our brain cells. With all information that we have, the technology, especially fMRI, we are hopeful that we can understand more as what's going on in our brain, and not necessarily human brain, could be simple species, and connect them to better learning. That is going to be a jump start and it's going to be a revolution by itself. So we are in the first phase of AI revolution, but the next one are coming based on that discovery. And then also more work is done in conversational intelligence and some of the things that you saw in child GPT is related to this. And also I would say Harvard implementation in regard to making these faster and real time. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation. And thank you so much for listening. <laughs>